better. Okay, so apparently we are now live. Um, and I wanna, I'm looking at the chat, maybe people will type in things so we know that we're live. But <clears throat> it's like we finally got it figured out how to use this stuff. And now as we started this session, it says that uh, this thing we're using now is gonna go away tomorrow. And then there's this whole other thing now. And we have to, now we have to learn a whole new thing. <laughs> I was just yeah. thinking, like, hey, I think we got this down finally. After yeah. all these tries, we're finally learning. Yeah. <laughs> we only went to the wrong place once. Okay, so we're doing a thing. This time it's a little bit different. Um, we have we found this stuff about uh, um, sharing the screen. So um, can you guys see the book or see the chapter of the book? We've got... Yeah, uh, it's up. Yeah, it's on the, it should be on the screen right now. Um, chapter 24, the conventional lawn versus a mobile meadow. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so I think, a, a, so first of all, I want the people that are that are live right now to be able to type something and say that they can see it. That'll be helpful. Um, oh, good. They can see it. Awesome. Um, uh, I think that uh, the news from the news front is, is that uh, we the book is at the printer. And uh, uh, Sean was just telling me a moment ago about how the printer has lots of questions. And, and so Sean's going to have to answer all these questions now. And it's part of the process. But it's happening. Also, the ebook version is now in layout. And the, the uh, audiobook stuff has started. Now, there, were, there have been a couple of people during the Kickstarter. Uh, and um, uh, one of them was a big supporter of the Kickstarter, and one of them is somebody who has been here at Wheaton Labs before for a long time. Uh, that would be Cliff Ponder. And they both said that they want to do the voice for the book. And it's kind of like, um, my understanding is, is that you have to be in the system where the audio book is being processed. So, um, uh, so Sean, you said that later today you're going to email those guys and say, hey, you know, Now's the time. Get your name in over there. Because right. apparently they're holding auditions. I don't know what that means exactly. I guess, Sean, it, you'll... It sounds cool, though. Yeah. Like, they're going to read a piece of the book, and we're going to be able to hear them read it, and we're going to decide whether or not, you know, they've got the uh, the life and sparkle that we need for our book. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, And Sean's in charge of it all. So if you want to bribe somebody you have to bribe sean <laughs> bribing me doesn't do any good <laughs> and, and, and oh. any any complaints can be sent to spam at uh... <laughs> <laughs> so um i know that uh a lot of people ask that i read it but um my understanding is is to do the voicey part for a book like this would take like three weeks and um, I, I'm just so drowning in projects right now. I, I don't see a way I can do that. And, yeah. um, and I'm it, it takes three weeks, but it also takes like sound engineering and proper audio processing and making sure that you don't have some weird fan noises in your room and all sorts of things that we both don't want to deal with, which is why we're going with a company that's just saying, yeah, we'll guarantee that all these things are fine. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I, I feel like this is just a cheap excuse that anybody could just say like, oh, I can't do it cause I'm busy. And, and that's kind of, and so I feel like I need to spell out all the things. But we are working on getting the PEP book into an alpha state so it can be shared because that's one of the things that we offered in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's in the works now. Uh, Raven's been putting a lot of work into it and Sean's been putting a lot of work into it. So, uh, But I've also been putting a lot of work into it. And then there's four other books that I have in the hopper that need to be brought up to an alpha state to be shared. And there's still some of the um, the candy to be handed out. I was driving an excavator yesterday. Um, we're um, making some changes to one of the roads that we have up on the lab. And um, and so I need to get back up there and, and do some more on that. Uh, and uh, there's just 
there's just stuff. There's just so much stuff. And uh, but I will be going to the Seattle area here really soon for us. Uh, so I'll be working remotely. Uh, and another thing is, is that we have like 15 people here right now. We've got uh, um, a bunch of people in the boot camp, and then um, our regulars and uh, Coco is here helping to put together events. And uh, somebody from the PDC last year has come by with their family. And so you know, wow, big big crowd. It was the house was pretty packed last night. So. The, the bottom line is, is that um, the audiobook is, the process is, has begun, and I'm, and I'm hoping that the uh, printer will be done printing the books in about four weeks, hopefully mm -hmm. less than four weeks, and then the books will be on their way here. Um, and once the books have been shipped, then we hope to tell people about a specific date for the signing party. And that's when Sean is going to come here and we're going to sign the books because we've made that part of, we were, we've were we learned that that's an important thing. You don't leave out. Apparently people need to have their books signed um, or some people do. So we made that at the $100 level, you get one signed book. And um, so uh, um, that's, uh, um, we're gonna so, so with Sean here. We're both going. We're gonna pull out all those books that need to have a signature. So I guess Sean, there'll be like seven hundred books because there's seven hundred yeah. people that supported at a hundred dollars or higher, and That's so great. we're going to have to sign. Get your hand stretches ready. Shit, that just seems crazy. Okay, and um, uh. But then we'll start once we will we'll ship those ones first. The hundred dollar and up folks will get theirs shipped out first, and then uh, and then we'll go on down uh, the line from there. Oh, um, uh, and hopefully the audio book and the ebook will be ready at the same time. And a lot of people have been asking about how is the ebook going to be provided, um, and I think that where we're settling on is the EPUB format. Um, and, it, but, but we won't, we won't make any promises because we keep learning new things like every other day. Yeah. Um, so we'll be putting it out with the EPUB and it'll definitely be flowable. And we've already, so we had a bunch of people that were very insistent that it has to be a flowable format. We did a, a poll and um, uh, I think it was like, Flowable had twice as many votes as static, yeah. and it, and part of flowable is is that we can't include all the doodles, and they're just doodles. They're not like critical pieces of the book, um, and and it's like uh, so it's like okay, you can have flowable, but with at, I think probably about seventy percent of the doodles won't be there, uh, or you can have fixed pages, and all the doodles will be there, and. Uh, Flowable is beating fixed two to one, and and we've had some people that are already like, but I want all the doodles. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, we gotta pick one here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. So, uh, somebody is writing. Oh, I think that this is Raven. Um, she says seven hundred bucks. Don't forget to bring extra pins that are smooth to write with. Um, okay, bring some pins when you come down. Okay, Sean? What? Am I going to have issues at the border with that? Maybe you should just <laughs> <Yeah>. get them. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't look like an American Why pin. do you have three boxes of pins in your car, sir? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a controlled substance, pins. <laughs> uh, Flowable, uh, like a Kindle book, can change the font and font size and other things. Yeah, we've had some people say something about, like, uh, apparently you can change the font which helps certain people who've like got dyslexia and stuff. Like there's certain fonts that help and you can, you can do that. Um, well, that or even just making the font size bigger or what have you, you know, okay. lots of, lots of helpful things there. I personally enjoy that. You can, you can read it on all sorts of devices and you're not like pinching to zoom. I hate pinching to zoom. Oh, anyway, right. 
or or like when you read a static page on your phone for like a web page and you got to kind of scroll it left and right as you're trying to read it yeah those are the websites that nobody goes to anymore <laughs> <laughs> all right so what we're viewing today and um and so the pod people won't be able to see what we're viewing um uh, uh is going to be the pdf so this is the thing that was sent to the printer so for those of you that are uh watching this over on youtube you're going to see the actual chapter and uh this is uh chapter 24 the conventional lawn versus a mobile meadow and for those of you that have read my article on this there are some things in this that are new and improved um although i think the article is still great uh as it stands uh i i kind of feel a little bit like i wish it was still number one in the search engines like it used to be for ages um because then i'm like you know changing minds and mass and and it's like i don't even know what how sdo works anymore um, so I don't, so I imagine that, um, like these big companies want to own lawn care. And so then they pay people millions of dollars to make sure that they're on top of, uh, the web searches and stuff. And so a page like mine, you know, floats to the bottom. I'm probably like, you know, page 20 of lawn care searches or something now. But for a while, I think, uh, I was, in fact, like for a while, I think my article about lawn care was the only lawn care article on the internet which is you know big reason why it was number one and that was still in an era when big companies didn't believe there was such a thing as the internet like that's just something that you know geeks do or something right so things have changed all right and on the image so this will be the first time people will be able to see this is something that we've added to all the chapters yeah. every every chapter has a little border around it around the chapter title and this one shows uh, pathetic grass growing along the top side, and on the bottom side is our mobile meadow. Yay, mobile meadow. Fear the dandelion! Fear it! Wild, psychotic screaming goes here. No, don't fear it. That's just silly. The amount of money spent to teach you to fear dandelions is huge, all because most people can be convinced to buy dandelion poison. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there is a large movement to replace all lawns with gardens. So I'm sure you've heard this, food, not lawns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I love what they're trying to do with food, not lawns. Mm -hmm. But I kind of feel like, you know, like there's, so for example, there's the thing called zero waste. Uh, and there, for a long time, and I don't think anybody, I think if you say zero waste, then it's like people, I could possibly dismiss it because it's like that's that's asking for a bit much zero waste and and so then they're less likely to get on board plus a lot of the people that are contemplating zero waste and i use that word contemplating then um it's like they're not uh uh they're 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 not doing zero waste they're doing less waste so and then there was that movie for a while zero or no impact man and it's kind of like he totally makes an impact you know and it's kind of like uh, it's kind of so bugs me but anyway the food not lawns group i get what they're trying to do but i kind of feel like you know what there's a time and a place for a lawn mm -hmm. and and so um i i kind of feel like i i wish they because i kind of i feel like part of what they're doing is they're teaching people to do lawn shaming and I, I, it's like, whoa, 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 back the truck up here. You know, can we, we can have a little lawn. That's okay. So um, I'm, plus a big thing, and this is why it fits so well in this book, is that with just a little bit of knowledge and a couple of small changes, you can eliminate your weed and feed and probably eliminate three quarters of your irrigation and have the nicest looking lawn on the block. And, um, to only people who will look really closely will you have a, a meadow, a whole bunch of stuff growing in your lawn uh, along with, uh, uh, you know, grass, actual grasses. Okay. Um, although I am bonkers about gardens, I do enjoy a lovely lawn. It's a place for picnics, lounging, yard sales, kids to play, people to gather, 
it's a huge tool in the community building tool set. And I enjoy a lawn tapestry richer than the grass monocrop. I want to add in 50 species of plants and relabel my lawn as a mobile meadow and embrace and eat the dandelion. But that's a lovely conversation for five years into the future. For now, let's talk about how to have the most magnificent lawn on your block without toxic gick, using less water and requiring less effort. This is a, probably a good time to point out that for a lot of people, uh, the whole thing about um, having a lawn is it's required by law. Most right. places in the United States, and I don't know if this is true in Canada also, you are legally required to grow a lawn in your front yard where people can see it. And, and there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, how it has to look. Um, and if you don't grow it the particular way, so the fines can be steep. I, I saw something recently where uh, some guy had to leave for three weeks because somebody in his family was dying. And when he came back, he found that he had like uh, thousands of dollars in fines uh, which quickly grew to something like thirty thousand dollars, you know, as he's trying to get it all sorted out. So um, I, it's it's kind of like wow, this is this is just brutal. So part of this is is that if this guy had just mown his lawn just before he left for three weeks, it probably would look pretty fine by the time he got back, and there wouldn't wouldn't have been an issue. But when you mow it the wrong way, which is the way most people do it then um yeah fines clearly yeah so let's in, see in the in the big city in our province which isn't particularly large um there's talk of well there's already like complaint driven stuff but i think i i read something a while back where there's talk of like basically making it so you are not allowed to grow a garden in your front lot or and maybe it was even like putting a restriction on how tall your grass is allowed to grow it's like really yeah i mean uh i i kind of feel like the solution to damn near everything is to get out of the city um mm -hmm. but of course you know the city also has a lot to offer um you know uh for example some people have a permaculture lifestyle in the city where they uh uh they walk everywhere or yeah. ride a bike and they don't yeah. own a car Mm -hmm. And everything that they need, they've got all kinds of fun stuff that's within such a short distance. And it's a, that's a, a magnificent existence. But of course, it's difficult to grow a garden there. And, mm -hmm. a, and a garden is such a massive component. But all right, all right. For now, let's talk about how to have the most magnificent lawn on your block without toxic gick, using less water, and requiring less effort. Something that will be low in dandelions and other non-grass plants and something that will sequester 10 times more carbon. The key to the lawn care game is competition. Make the grass happier than the other plants and have almost nothing but grass. Battle for the sun deathmatch! Rig the game for grass. So for, for the podcast people who can't tell, that's a new that's a new section in the chapter. <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna read all the section titles the same way. I'll, it'll it'll depend. Um all right, so here's our battle for the sun death match. And so we're going to what we want to do is we want to come up with stuff that makes us, the grass is happy, but the non grass plants are sad. Uh mowing high is by far the most important thing, uh, by far, most important. That's actually written in the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm I'm reading this. I I can say it louder if that will help. And and that's also written in the book. <laughs> there is a fight for sun. If the grass doesn't shade the dandelion, the dandelion will shade the grass. Sun is food. Food is strength and life. Shade is weakness, disease, and death. Grass will shade the dandelion only if it is tall enough. The shade of tall, dense grass turf will prevent essential light 
from reaching most dandelions and will aid in the destruction of new baby dandelion seedlings. Now, this is a good time to point out that grass is a perennial. And so grass uh, just makes new grass plants all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the dandelion and most other plants, you know, most, most non-grass plants, uh, so a dandelion is also a perennial. It lives about five years. And so it's like, okay, so you've got an established dandelion. It is going to become sad when it's surrounded by the taller grass, but it's not going to die from it. Um, and so, but after five years of mowing high, you'll, um, uh, most of the dandelions will have, that are perennial will have died out and then the new babies will not have gotten a good start. And so they will have also died out. So by after five years of mow of doing nothing but mowing high, then um, uh, you'll you'll have a lawn free of dandelions. But a lot of people will start mowing high, and they're like, "Oh, the dandelions are still there. It didn't work." And it's like, "No, no, dandelions. It's going to take a while." But um, I think you'll find that even after one year, you'll have, or even after about a month and a half, you'll have very dramatic results. After two weeks of mowing high, I think you'll already start to see a difference. In fact, on my article about um, lawn care, I have a picture where somebody uh, decided to mow sh really short, and then I stopped them, and I finished the mowing, mowing high, and uh, then I took a picture like a week later, and you can see that the grass like you see the distinct lines, the grass that was mown high is um, green and healthy. And the grass that is mowed short is brown and sad. So it's like, oh, it's, it, it makes a dramatic difference quickly. All right, myth, if I mow short, it will be longer until I have to mow again. False, wrong, slap, slap, slap. Grass needs grass blades to do photosynthesis, convert sunshine into sugar to feed the roots. When the blades are whacked off, the grass has to race to make more blades to make sugar. It then grows amazingly fast. This fast growth uses up a lot of the grass's stored sugar and weakens the plant. It is now vulnerable to disease and pests. Tall grass is healthier and can use the extra sugar to make rhizomes, more grass plants, thus thickening the turf. And, and here we have this lovely collection of images that um, took us so long uh, to get drawn just right. Um, but uh, the idea was is that on the left uh, is the same grass plant uh, one got mowed high and one got mowed low. And then we're showing it a week later how the um, uh, smaller plant is um, making a very rough lawn very quickly and um, is, is like pretty pathetic and sad. Whereas the one that was mowed tall did grow up a little bit, but it's kind of holding things looking in this, this flat top look while at the same time putting it, growing more grass blades and having a deeper root system. Do, 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 do. If you have a serious dandelion infestation, consider mowing twice as frequently as you normally do. The sensitive growing point for grass is near the soil. The sensitive growing point for most other plants is near the top of the plant. So when you mow, it's as if you're giving your grass a haircut and cutting the heads off the other plants. Finally, when mowing, be sure to leave the clippings on the lawn. It adds organic matter and nutrients back into the soil. If you don't leave the clippings, your soil will begin to look more like dirt than soil. Soon it will be a form of cement that nothing will grow in and you'll have the world's most pitiful lawn. Some people are concerned about grass trimmings clumping. That only happens when you mow too short or when you don't mow often enough. So clumping is a real problem. So if you've got a big gob of grass and a bunch and it's sitting on top of your lawn 
it'll make a dead spot in your lawn. So as that clump of grass that's like, and I'm kind of thinking of something that's like the size of a, I don't know, maybe a football. And so, yeah. and that's an American football. <laughs> Smaller than a soccer ball. Um, so anyway, uh, I think that the, um, uh, if you had something the size of a football and it's setting on your grass, it's going to break down in a very hot manner, so hot that it's going to burn the grass underneath and you're going to have a dead spot in your lawn. So you want to not have the clumping. And so if you mow often enough, then you don't ever get clumping. You just get these little bits of grass that fall between the grass blades and land on the ground, and then it's fine. It'll work out great. It's providing the perfect kind of organic matter for grass. Um, it's the clumping that's a problem. And so if, and if you're clumping, then, you know, we, you got to solve that. Don't, don't just leave it there. Um, mowing higher gives the following perks. More shade to the soil, which leads to less watering. Deeper roots, which leads to less watering. Thicker turf, which leads to fewer dandelions. Slower vertical growth, which leads to less mowing. More plant matter sequestering carbon. All right. Have, uh, so, Sean, I know I've, I've seen the chat thing has been pouring out lots of stuff. Um, can, is there anything that we should address? Uh, we've just been chatting a little bit about city layout and city rules and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I see something about enjoying the doodles. By the way, this is not considered a, a doodle, the one with the grasses here. This one is uh, considered critical to the story. And so this image will be in the ebook. Um, and this one will also be in the ebook. This is a critical image. Um, now that one there is just a picture of a dandelion. Um, that one um, is a doodle and it may or may not stay. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much of this I mean, but a, quite a few of these images in this chapter are critical. I don't think there's a lot of bonus doodles in here. So um, I think all these images will be in the ebook version. Um, as if we do some more podcasts like this, which, by the way, it's uh, I've I've asked uh, Sean to make this podcast um, uh, as part of like I I would like to get my podcast kind of rolling again, and I said, hey, maybe once a week we can do a chapter, and and Sean said, okay, let's try for once a week, but we'll probably end up with like two a month or something, and, uh, and okay, cool. All right. Oh, I see something about dog poop um, uh, in the in the chat. And so there's nothing about dog poop in this chapter. I mean, this is more about planting the seed of an idea than it is about being a full book on my philosophies on lawn care. But when it comes to dog poop, let me just share uh, one quick thing. So the problem with dog poop in your lawn is, A, you might step in it, and that is not a good time. Um, <clears throat> B, if you're into barefoot. Right, and I think lawns should be all about being barefoot. Um, and, and so B is that as you approach it, it is putting off an odois that is probably not doing well on the quality of life spectrum. And so it's like, okay, not a big fan of the smell. Uh, the sight, not a big fan of that either. Now, one thing that the dog poop does offer is that it's going to um, be a big uh, fertilizer hit. Probably too much in the fertilizer department. So what I like, and now this is a matter of taste, is to take sawdust and put sawdust on the dog poop. There's a couple of big reasons for this. One is, I do not want to ever pick up dog poop. I mean, this whole thing where people have a system where they're picking up dog poop is like, okay, I guess it's respectful to the others, but I'm kind of thinking like, surely you can come up with a better system than this. So the concept of going somewhere and picking up the poop of a dog 
just drives me nuts. Like this, it, you, you need to design your system in such a way that you're being respectful to everybody while at the same time not picking up dog poop. Now, when living in the country, like when I was living on Mount Spokane, currently I don't have dogs. When I was on Mount Spokane, I did have dogs. I never saw dog poop. I don't know why. I think they just, you know, they went 200 yards out maybe and hit it or something. I have no idea what happened, but, but three different dogs made it so magically we never saw dog poop. Maybe that's part of it, but sawdust. So if you're in the city or whatever, like let's say you've got a backyard and you keep your dog in your backyard and now there's landmines everywhere. Uh, put sawdust on it. I'll just put a make a little sawdust pile. Um, now, granted, you know what's under the sawdust, and mm -hmm. so you're kind of like, oh, it's still there. But if somebody accidentally steps on it, chances are if there's enough sawdust, you're never going to experience the dog poop. The other thing is, is that um, it's going to eliminate the smell. And another one is, is that it's going to suck up a lot of the nitrogen from the dog poop so it's not too much fertilizer in one spot. It's going to balance it out. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you end up transforming your lawn into these little piles of sawdust, which is you're kind of looking at that and thinking to yourself like, I'm not sure if this is better or worse. <laughs> but for a, for a certain frame of mind, I think it's better because I think that um, uh, now all of that all of that material can work its way into the soil. Now, as your soil quality goes up, the dog poop will disappear faster into your yard. Of course, there is the problem of winter time. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. old damn lawn's covered in sawdust. <laughs> oh, the spring but, melt is always a bit. Well, I think that when you get to the spring melt and you put sawdust on everything, I think you, you won't really notice it at all. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, all right. Uh, we have another question here from someone who's asking if, can I sow over my existing weedy yard? Um, you can. I mean, I, I kind of feel like I want to, oh, I, I want to turn this into a two hour long conversation. Like I, I want to know about your soil story. Like, like if you dig a hole two feet deep, what do you see? And um, and I think that's more important because it's like um, if your soil is truly pathetic, that only pathetic things are growing there, then, um, and you go and you oversee, this is what they call it. I mean, I think 90, I would say 97% of the time, overseeding is dumb, but of course it's going to be totally advocated by those companies that sell seed, <laughs> you know, yeah. Hey, sure. Overseed. It'll be great. I swear. Just in case <laughs> can't hurt. Hey, and if it doesn't work the first time, you can always try 47 more times because <laughs> we got more seed to sell you. Yeah. He says so, he has cl clay soil. Clay soil is uh, his answer. Um, and, and so I kind of wonder about like, uh, okay, what can we do? Like, let's suppose he's got two inches of topsoil and then the clay is like such a hard pack beneath that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, there's no life in it. It's, it's like you could just, you could get a shovel full of it and you can go and make pottery with it. Right. It's like, it's like, this is some serious clay. Let's pretend that's the case. Then, then my first thought is, is it's like, I want, I want to like, that's, that's pathetic. I don't like it. I want to dig up the whole damn yard and I want to, I want to mix in anything into that clay down a good 18 inches to make it into, um, um, soil. Now we've got something coming up here in a bit. Maybe, maybe the thing to do is, is that we can come back to this, but sure, yeah. Um, yeah, we but, have a couple more ideas later in the chapter that might, uh, but for the most more. part, overseeding is a waste of time you know, nearly universally. And, and you just hear so much about it because there's somebody on the other end of that seed that's making some coin and they're just doing their job advertising seed 
and yeah, if you overseed, there is a chance that a couple of those seeds will dig in and who knows, maybe it'll change. But it's like most of the time, it's like if you want to if you want to change the species of grass that's dominant in your lawn, then um, I think that usually the thing's gonna the, the thing that you're gonna want to do is to put down four inches of topsoil. And when I say topsoil, do not buy topsoil from a place where they're mixing dirt with something called compost. It's because that stuff that's that they call compost is usually uh, industrial waste. I mean, like, and, and I, I, let me take out the word usually. It's industrial waste. <laughs> and, and it's like, uh, uh, don't, don't get mixed up in that stuff um, uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Just please don't touch that. I've, I mean, I've got, I've got a good hour and a half to say on why, but I hate it when we have a, a lovely thing going about permaculture and it ends up being in a big lesson about pesticides. Yeah. Um, and specifically in this case, herbicides. So I, I just, I'm, I don't want to go down that road at this time. But how about when we get to the end of the chapter, let's come back to that one about the overseeding because yeah, we've yeah. got something, we've, we've got a bigger idea coming. Now, have there been any other things that are, like now is a good time to, to talk? Somebody, I see something about three inches and it's like set your mower as high as it'll go. And uh, for some people that's four inches and some people it's three inches. If it's if your mower will not go three inches or taller, you got to get a different mower. Yeah, and and I've got a really old cordless electric. I don't even know if they make it anymore, but uh, we replaced we we repaired the battery this spring, and Jocelyn's got a couple spots where she wants there to be lawn, and thanks to uh, one of these spots, it's kind of like a, a a discreet spot for people to pee, <laughs> and and uh, boy, grass loves that urine. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And so it's 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 got some very healthy grass there. And so she's going down there and mowing it to make it this beautiful little lawn. And we've got a couple of other patches where we need more people to go out there and pee. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and uh, eventually, it'll become this beautiful lawn. All right. Uh, there's another question in here about uh, do y'all have an opinion on the use of a scythe versus a lawnmower? I think I think that uh, anybody who mows their lawn with a scythe should get like a special pin yeah. on their lapel and uh, be able to strut around town, and 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 then all people who see it will be like, "Ooh, that person's a better person than I am," you know, something like that. And so um, uh, I I think it's cool. I think it's super cool. I mean, there's there's stuff about using a scythe that um, uh, is got some challenges. Like you want to do it when it's wet. You want to keep your blade peened and sharpened, and mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But uh, I've seen it done. People can do it. I have not personally tried to uh, scythe a lawn before, but I have seen it done. And I am impressed. And so, my if if you're if you're mowing your lawn with a scythe, my hat is off. That is, I'm impressed. That's cool. He says, "I wish, I hope someday I can grow up and be as cool as you." He says, "How would I go about getting one of those pins?" <laughs> I think you have to have it custom made because there's so few people that can get that pin. <laughs> But I think really what comes with it is the is the marketing part that's going to be telling people, hey, if you see somebody with this pin, you need to give them a big thumbs up, tip of the hat, and all that stuff. Give them the recognition they deserve for being so fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. Any other questions at this time? Nope. Let's uh, keep going. Moving along. Uh, uh, the next section is called Tough Training Leads to Strong Grasses with Deep Resilient roots. Shallow, frequent watering encourages thatch. The grass propagates above soil. Uh, let's see, the grass propagates with above soil runners, like strawberry runners, rather than rhizomes under the soil. There gets to be so many runners that they weave a mat that chokes out water and air. Since the roots are in the top inch or two of soil, a hot day will 
quickly dry the soil and much of the grass will brown. Dandelion seedlings love a daily watering. It's just what they need to get a good start. I recommend watering deeply and less often. This will force your grass roots to go deep into the soil, deeper than the roots of most other plants. And as the top few inches of soil become bone dry, the seedlings of the other plants will die while the grass still enjoys moisture from a little deeper. Two methods to tell when it's time to water. Method one, uh, the grass will start to curl before it turns brown. When it starts to curl, that is the best time to water. Number two, take a shovel and stick it into the soil about six inches. Keep the sun to your left or to your right when you do this, so you can see in the hole. Push the handle forward. If you can see any moisture, wait. If it's all dry, water. If you can't get your shovel to go into the soil this deep, you need more soil. The first method is the best, especially if you've not yet trained your grass to make deep roots. A tip for lawn care experts, uh, and and Sean, I'm, I'm guessing you remember, I mean, we've got probably an hour of debate <laughs> over this paragraph. <clears throat> uh. Yeah, yeah, but this is what we said a lot. We can't change it now. It's gone to the printer. Nope. The whole time we've been going through this, I keep thinking to myself, Paul, better not say, oh, we need to change this now. <laughs> it's too late, man. It's too late. I'm I'm just seeing stuff. I'm I'm kind of tripping up on some of the hyphenated word stuff, and trying to mix that in with the M dash stuff, and it's like, uh, oh, um, what? Okay, all right. A tip for lawn care experts: if it is almost time to water, and there is a rain shower, maybe a quarter of an inch, that is the best time to water your lawn to give it another three quarters of an inch. Remember, the grass roots are down deep and most weed roots are near the surface. The idea is to keep the top three inches of soil as dry as you can for as long as you can. That quarter of an inch of rain might make it so that your top three inches of soil is well watered by the lower nine to 20 inches. What? 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 At, at the lower. But, okay, all right, okay, all right. Let me, let's, this whole sentence has got all these little things in here about, you know, um, metric stuff. And so I'm trying to like to get past the metrics. Okay, that quarter of an inch of rain might make it so that your top three inches of soil is well watered, but the lower nine to 20 inches is on the edge of being pretty dry. This gives the shallow rooted plants an advantage over your grass. So um, I know that I've had people like years ago when I wrote my first article that it would start to rain and that's when I put my sprinklers out and I had people tell me like, doesn't that seem dumb that you're like, you got your sprinkler running at the same time that it's raining? And um, it's like, no, <laughs> this, is, this is the smart time. This is the smart time. Another thing is, is like a lot of times when you uh, use an actual sprinkler, then um, a lot of that water will evaporate before it even, you know, gets into the soil. Oh, yeah. Whereas if it's currently actively raining, <laughs> then it all goes into the soil. So uh, no, actually, because uh, a lot of times when it's raining, um, you're, it's going to rain like just a tenth of an inch or a, a quarter of an inch. Whereas you want like a full inch, like an inch of water will go 12 inches down. And if you've got soil that goes down 18 inches, then you might want to even like, you know, get a, even more water to go down. Yeah. We, uh, we drove past a field the other day that had one of those gigantic sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it was super hot. And I was just like, I bet you more than half of that is evaporating before it hits the ground. This is... Yeah. 
And once it hits the ground, most of it is evaporating there too. And, and you know, the I think a big thing is, is that, um, I mean, we're going to, one of the chapters we have, and I'm not sure if we've put it into a, a podcast yet, is that uh, that chapter where we talk about what to do with 20,000 acres is um, replacing yeah. petroleum with people. Yeah, we did that one already. Okay. In which case, I don't think you're going to have any of those giant sprinklers like that. No. You know, how do we replace? In fact, with good lawn care, and we're going to get to this here in a little bit, if you take good care of your lawn, eventually you can you can... In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, eventually, you can eliminate all of the irrigation from your lawn. You can have a magnificent lawn that's green all summer long, and there's no irrigation at all. And, and we touch on that just barely here in a little bit. And I think that that uh, if, if I were to write this chapter uh, and say that specifically, um, I'm not sure, Sean, would you be like cool with that? I would be uneasy with the idea. Okay. It's, I, I think it's possible, though. But I, I don't think it's a slam dunk. Everyone could do it. I, I would, I, I'm, I'm tempted to want to take up that challenge. But, I, but I'm, open to the, I'm open to the possibility. Yeah, I, I think I, uh, I, I, I've seen near successes, and I kind of feel like, oh, I need to get a, in fact, um, I got to get moved up to the lab where we've got these uh, uh, forty-foot deep subsoils, um, and I could I could try and make a lawn that is uh, this magnificent and doesn't require any irrigation. Um, but that would be a project for another day. <laughs> right. um, here at Base Camp, where I live right now, it's solid rock. <laughs> it's like good yeah. luck. I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the only thing you do is like, you know, pour on a bunch of soil. But anyway, all right. <clears throat> Remember, the grass roots are down deep and most weed roots are near the surface. The idea is to keep the top three inches of soil as dry as you can, as long as you can. That quarter of an inch of rain might make it so that your top three inches of soil is well watered by the lower nine but, to 20 inches. By the lower ah fuck this is that same sentence isn't it yeah that quarter of an inch of rain might make it so that your top three inches of soil is well watered but the lower nine to 20 inches is on the ed edge of being pretty dry maybe we need to make a note for uh, a second edition to <laughs> enhance that but <laughs> <laughs> all right all right i'm going to move on to the next paragraph another thing about lawn care watering I have discovered that if you're going, I have discovered that if you're going to water an inch, it's better to water half an inch, wait 90 minutes, and then water another half an inch. Maybe do this once a month. Sometimes when the soil gets really dry, it will repel water. This is called super deflocculation. I think Mary Poppins would be impressed with this word. <laughs> if you put, uh, sometimes it's referred to as being hydrophob hydrophobic, but there's degrees of, of hydrophobia, and then there's the deflocculation. If you put a, a little water in first, then wait, the soil is better prepared to take in more water. Remember, water has a strange and powerful attraction to itself. It would much rather stick to itself then disperse through the soil. Another perk. <clears throat> Every time you water, you wash away soil nutrients. So the less you water, the more fertile your soil. One last point about watering deeply. If your topsoil is only two inches deep, laying down an inch of water is a bad idea. An inch of water is good for watering 12 inches of soil. Further, an inch of water will effectively carry a lot of soil nutrients down deeper. So if your soil is only two inches deep, this rinses away a lot of your soil nutrients. Therefore, deep watering should be done only in conjunction with deep soil. All right, any other questions at this time? 
Uh, there was one person who was saying, uh, we, we were saying that the weed roots are usually shallow. They were saying their weed roots usually go down very deep. And thus the watering. Right. So, for example, a, a, a dandelion yeah. is going to have a taproot. A dandelion is just such a magnificent permaculture plant in so many ways. But it does have a taproot. On the other hand, its lifespan is five years. And yeah. so um, and now, depending on which plant we talk about, um, if they do have a, a root that goes down really deep, then, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, what's its age? Now, the next thing is, is that um, when the grass makes a new baby grass plant, it is tied into all these other grass plants that are around that have deep roots. And so it's going to help this new grass plant get a start using water from down deep. Yeah. But the dandelion is not going to do that. The dandelion is going to put a seed on the surface. And it's like, good luck, little seed, you're on your own. And then it's going to germinate and make a little teeny tiny dandelion baby. Only then the soil turns all dry and it hasn't made its little baby taproot yet. And now that dandelion plant, that little seedling dies and it doesn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. all right. Okay. So I don't Did I answer the concern? Did it, you know, I think you responded to it. Okay. All right, cool. I'm moving on. <clears throat> the next section is called deep, rich, magnificent soil versus thin, pathetic dirt. And so um, my first thought is, hey, Sean, I see you solved the versus problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh... I guess we're doing it without the little period on it then. It's all consistent. That's the important thing. Right, right. It's either all with a period or all without. So it looks like we're going without. Okay, good to know. <laughs> uh, at one place I lived, my soil was only half an inch deep. Even weeds had a tough time growing. Below my half inch of soil were huge river rocks, separated by smaller rocks, separated by sand. It bore no resemblance to soil. I added four inches of topsoil. This was done with two dump truck loads at $100 a pop. It covered all of the weeds with enough soil so they could not work through it. And I could start from scratch with my grass seed of choice. I like tall fescue. All right. I wonder if I say anything here about the kind of dirt. So this particular dirt that I brought in uh, was coming from a field that was just riddled with weeds. So, um, Ooh. yeah, that, that shows good, this. Good point. It was nice black stuff, and they were apologizing that it's full of nap weeds. And I'm like, no, thank you, man. That is that is the fact that it's full of nap weeds and other weeds is is a great sign of how this is this is the good stuff. Oh, you do, you do mention it two paragraphs down. So oh, okay. There. All right. All right. Uh, 18 inches or more soil would be optimal. I have a friend that has soil this deep. While everyone else waters a dozen times or more over the summer, she waters just once or twice. She uses no fertilizer or pesticides. She has a thick, dark green, weed-free grass. Her lawn is about as no-brainer lawn care as you could get. This is a good time to talk about soil quality, too. There's a big difference between dirt and soil. Soil is rich in microbial life and has a lot of organic matter in it. Dirt comes in many forms, and it is a challenge to get anything to grow in it. If you're getting topsoil delivered to your house, be prepared for it to bear more resemblance to dirt. Make sure that the source is full of non-grass plants. This is to make sure that it does not contain persistent herbicides. Do not get soil that's made from dirt and commercial compost. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think that uh, the, the big concern we have is with persistent herbicides, which is a broadleaf herbicide. So grasses will grow fine in it, 
but nothing else will. So if you're if if people are out there and they're kind of thinking to themselves that you know they want to grow a perfect grass lawn and they don't they don't believe there's such a thing as toxic gick, then hey maybe they want to get some that only grasses will grow in, and that's one way to solve the problem. Although um, if you've got trees and shrubs in your lawn, you'll notice that those are not grasses. <laughs> And so you're going to poison them, and they're going to die. Um, anyway, uh, I think we talked about the commercial compost already, so I'm ready to move on. Any other questions at this point? Yep. I think going. the I think the image is a really good one. So we show like yeah. um, a shallow soil, and we show a deep soil, and and how the roots for the shallow soil, the grass roots can't go down, so you can't can't grow a big grass you cannot grow a tall grass you got to have the the deeper soil to grow the the healthier tall grass yeah all right the next section is called free fertilizers stomp the poopies out of the commercial offerings <laughs> in 1996 i com yeah we we i i think i wrote that didn't i that sounds yeah. like something i would write yeah that's one of those things. I mean, I think we spent like about uh, half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, like trying to compose an awesome uh, section title. And I think I won that one. Yeah, you did. Yeah. But this happened so many times throughout writing this book. I know one time I posted somewhere, somewhere on Permies where a few people could see, uh, I posted the brainstorm of one of our section title. Oh yeah, <laughs> two things, and I was just like, "Okay, for those of you who think it's easy to come up with section titles, here's the 38 that we went through before we settled." <laughs> and even then, it goes through rounds. Like, like, okay, we've got 38 section titles for this one, 38 contenders. Now we each have to pick our favorite and limit it to those two, and then we then we continue on after that. Um, and then we might do another 38. Yeah, and it's like, because right. it's like, this one still doesn't seem all that great. So free fertilizers stomp the poopies out of the commercial offerings. In 1996, I completed my master gardener training. I ended up being sent to several homes to give advice on a lot of things. And the number one problem with lawns was that the soil was deflated. What I mean is that there would be trees in the lawn and there were huge roots exposed. So I, I want to see validation from the chat people and um, that they have seen this where where the uh, like tree roots, which should be totally underground, are above ground. And they're kind of like these like three or four inches tall. Like there's no way you're getting a lawnmower over there. So I want to see chat people verifying that they have also seen that. <clears throat> and there's also an image on the screen right now right. Of, okay, of that so exact thing. So here's, here's one, yep. Yeah. Okay. So what I you know, mean is that there would be... Well, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I was just going to say I've seen this all over the place. So Yeah, I have too. I have too. What I mean is that there would be trees in the lawn and there were huge roots exposed. Sometimes the roots protruded six to 10 inches, like the tops of giant eels in a river of dirt. The grass would be thin and pitiful in a pathetic gray dirt that nearly resembled cement. Every time I said the same thing, when you mow, do you haul away the clippings? And they would say, Yes. And when the leaves fall off the tree, do you haul the leaves away too? Yes. At one point, these people had soil that would pump out happy trees and happy grass. Then they took all that lovely organic matter that would have fed the soil and hauled it away. As the years passed, there was less and less organic matter in the soil until all that was left was pathetic dirt. The soil deflated into dirt. 
With the help of a few earthworms, this process can be reversed. Lots of organic matter on top of the soil will not only feed the soil at the surface, but earthworms will take it pretty deep into the soil. The trick is that the soil will take in organic matter, but dirt will not. If you set the organic matter on a concrete sidewalk, the concrete doesn't take it in. If you take the same organic matter on, if, wait, if you set that same organic matter on the rich soil of a garden, the organic matter will be consumed by the soil in a few weeks or months. And just like most garden plants, grass loves a rich soil too. All right. I see lots of stuff going by in the chat. What's going on? Trying to keep up. Uh, there was a comment of roots need to breathe too. And someone else said, but trees need the roots up, don't they? No, trees do not. Trees do not need their roots up. And trees and roots need to breathe and they will breathe plenty under soil, but they will not breathe in dirt. Yeah. And so the other thing is, is that the parts of a root that needs to breathe is not going to be able to breathe if it's simply exposed to the direct air. It needs to put bark over that to protect itself. So it's not going to breathe through that. It, it needs to get those root hairs going. Yeah. It's, it's those root hairs that are going to be breathing it. The root hair is going to get air and water and nutrients. And it's like, um, but if, if it can't do root hairs, which it can't in, in the open air, there are a few plants that can do that, but they're mostly tropical and very rare. Some of them might be in a, in a place that has an extremely high humidity. But right. for most of us, those tree roots will not be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here's one. Uh, we never haul away our leaves, just mowing over them. They rot quickly and feed the lawn. I think we're going to say that here in a moment, or I'm not yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Oh, good, good, good. The simplest thing to do is to mow high and leave your clippings on the lawn. In time, this will work. I have some bigger things you can do, but first let's understand what grass wants. Grass is a nitrogen pig. Legumes, such as clover and black medic, can get their nitrogen from the air. Remember, the air we breathe is 78% nitrogen. So when you see legumes taking over your lawn, you know that your soil is nitrogen poor. Suppose you have a lawn that's about 50% clover. I think that's pretty great. As long as you leave all of your clippings on the lawn, you will be fine. In three to six years, you'll probably get to less than 10% clover. Patience is a powerful tool. <clears throat> so I got to say something about like we, we had a discussion on permies because on permies, uh, we have a, a, a thing about uh, don't state the truth. Instead, state your position. That makes it so that other people can state their position. Because if they have a position that's different than yours, but you're stating yours as the truth, then they feel like they're entering into a um, debate and they don't want to get into a debate. They're like they're, or they're entering into a conflict. They don't want to get into a conflict. So if you mm -hmm. state your position, it makes it clear that others are welcome to state their position too. So somebody was saying that Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, has certain things that he says are fact. And one of them was the air we breathe is 78% nitrogen. And I think he said the air we breathe will always be 78% nitrogen. And I spent two hours trying to come up with a scenario where that number might change 1%. Like it'll be 79% or 77%. And I'm kind of thinking like, you're inside the house and you're, you know, the house is all sealed and you're running a, a, a gas uh, stove and you're currently trying to heat up water or boil something or do canning or something, then um, it's going to consume a bunch of oxygen and displace that oxygen with carbon dioxide. But then the moment I said that, it's like, well, that doesn't, 
change the level of nitrogen, does it? Mm. <laughs> it's still the same. So I, I, I tried really hard to come up with scenarios that change that. The only thing I come up with is air that we don't breathe. And that's where there can sometimes be pockets of carbon dioxide, which then displace the, the air. And then, of course, they're, because they're, carbon dioxide is so heavy that you can get these uh, pools of carbon dioxide. Um, but then that's, that's a place where you go to die. Um, if you go into that stuff, you can't breathe it. You die. Right. So, so it's like, so anyway, I just kind of felt like sharing that little bit of trivia. I, I, tried, I tried to come up with a space to, to prove that statement could be false. Because the popular one that people say is the sky is blue. And then, you know, like you don't allow somebody to say the sky is green. And it's like, I don't know. Have you ever seen the Northern Lights? It's pretty green. I have seen them. Yeah. Lots, lots of green. Yeah, it's pretty green. That's some pretty green stuff right there. Look, the sky is green. So it, uh, it can be relative and subjective. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's see, do, do, do patience is a powerful tool. Okay. I see tons of comments going by what's happening. What's happening. People talking about lawns and legumes and kind of continuing the conversation that we were having. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Of course, most people want an amazing lawn instantly. The quick solution you can buy having varying degrees of toxicity. Rather than explore which villain is the worst, here's a quick list of non-toxic stuff that will work. Lawn clippings from your mulching mower. Pea on the shortest grasses. Organic hay. And we got the word organic underlined. Organic. And, and, and bolded. And bolded. Yeah. Maybe we could have gone with a bigger font. <laughs> Maybe we could like make little lines around it, little squiggles, like dun da da da. You know. So, but organic a tossed on your lawn just before you mow. Nitrogen fixing plants in the lawn, such as clover or black medic. And so, this might be a good time to point out that a lot of people point at black medic and they say, "Look, it's yellow clover." And or what they mean to say is that like most clover that people think of is called Dutch clover or Dutch white clover. So the blooms are white. And then black medic has leaves that are clover like leaves, but um, it has a tiny yellow flower. Mm -hmm. And so um, people point at black medic and say that's yellow clover. And uh, a lot of times when you mow low, <clears throat> black medic kind of makes a mat. It's like, oh, okay, I can do this low growing thing. No problem. And it kind of uh, chokes out all the grass. But when you mow high, then the black medic kind of grows high. It's, it's a, it, it does its own, it looks like a, 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 a clover that it grows up kind of grass-like to go to that sun that's up high. And, it, and it's like it, it does great in a lawn. Whereas if you mow low, it really kills the grass it, when it does that mat thing. Okay. Long-term soil. So this is a new section. Long-term soil versus short-term fertilizer. Adding high carbon material to the soil will, in a way, do the opposite of fertilizing the soil. In fact, it will cause nitrogen immobilization where most nitrogen in the soil will be temporarily unavailable to the grass. But this adds organic matter to the soil, giving parking places for water and nutrients, including nitrogen, and housing for the microscopic life that inhabits soil. It is that life and the carbon that are the difference between dirt and soil. High carbon material you can add to the soil surface of your lawn. Leaves that have been chopped up by a mulching mower. And I think I saw a comment where somebody was saying they just mow their leaves. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea, but it, there is also a path where you can get too much. Like if you mow your leaves and mow your leaves and mow your leaves, 
you might end up with so many leaves on your lawn that it smothers your lawn, which is kind of what the tree is wanting to do. The tree is the tree is kind of like, um, this is great soil right here. I really like the idea that I'm going to um, make it so nobody grows here but me and my special babies, and that's it. And so all these grasses are got to go. But of course, what a lot of people well, are required by law to have is a lawn. And right. so then, the, you know, the, those leaves will kill the lawn. And so you got to come up with a solution for that. And so uh, the solution is, is mow your leaves. But if you start getting a lot of leaves, okay, maybe rake some of those up into a compost pile and put them over there. Or uh, I actually think leaves are some of the very best mulches for all kinds of stuff. So if you want to do, take those leaves and use it as a mulch on a bunch of different places, they are great, but be careful if uh, you lay down uh, uh, leaves in the bad way, um, it can actually uh, create uh, an impermeable layer that kind of uh, strangles the plants below. Like air can't pass through, air and water won't be able to pass through those leaves. So you wanna, don't go too crazy with that, go easy, okay. Uh, so back to this list, high carbon material you can add to the soil surface of your lawn, leaves that have been chopped by a mulching mower, organic straw tossed on your lawn just before you mow. We should have done organic and, and uh, underlined and italicized and bolded and with the, uh, the, the uh, what, do you, what are you going to call it, jazz fingers around it, <laughs> like little, little uh, action blips or something, yeah. organic. This is an animated book. Yeah, like that. Ooh, even better. I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> uh, a dusting of sawdust, not wood chips, from untreated wood. If your soil is more like dirt right now, then you might want to go easy on the carbon stuff until your soil is amazing. With that in mind, I suggest, and then this is a new, a new section called bringing in the real professionals. Hint, they don't wear clothes. That's right. We had one of those things where we were uh, <laughs> working on our section title, and that's what we came up with. And I believe I, believe I wrote this one too. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so Sean, in fact, probably, Sean, Sean's probably more willing to work with me in the future if I own this one. <laughs> right, I love this one. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I think it's hilarious. Okay. Uh, you probably don't want to till up your yard. I don't want you to till up your yard. That's a lot of work. And it looks really ugly until the new lawn gets established. The grass you have now is a fine breed of grass. It's just in terrible soil. So most people are going to have Kentucky bluegrass, which is... Um, I, I believe, if memory serves, I believe Kentucky bluegrass is actually a type of tall fescue, which is, and tall fescue is what I recommend for, uh, for turf. The mission is to improve the soil so the grass will be happy. I wish for you to build a dozen or more worm towns. All right, so there's the word. This is a brand new word, worm towns. And this, this is something that we came up with right in the book. And because it's the technique, I mention it briefly in my article. But the great thing is, is several people have tried it and it works. So here we go. We've decided to call it a worm town. Dig a hole about three feet deep and at least eight inches in diameter. Then refill the hole. So refill the hole with that soil plus all the fixings for the most pampered living for earthworms. About eight inches from the top of the hole, add a half gallon of magnificent garden soil. Try to keep it in a block or sphere. Think of this magnificent garden soil blob as a seed containing garden magic, earthworm pods, good bacteria and fungus, 
soil building seeds, etc. If you break the seed or spread it out, all the magic dies. All right. Um, I think we did a good job of keeping this paragraph brief because I kind of wanted to go on for eight more paragraphs about this seed, this, this gob of garden soil. Right. And the, the big thing is, is that as long as it's in a gob, then um, all of that life in the soil is in the soil. But if you take the gob and you spread it out on cement, it dies almost instantly. And so you got to keep it in this precious, precious gob. All right. As the years pass, your earthworm, earthworm population will skyrocket. Organic matter will be spread all through the soil. The earthworms will not only create thousands of tiny tunnels, allowing air and water better access to the roots of your grasses, but they will create magnificent soil structure. Combined with your efforts of adding organic matter to the surface, maybe with nothing more than what is left behind from the mulching mower, your soil will become excellent and your grass will be strong and healthy without buying fertilizers. Okay, uh, three feet. Now, this image is gonna stay in the ebook version. But you can kind of see on the left, it's got a very thin soil. And then we put in the uh, worm towns and on the right. And it's much, much deeper soil. And um, I think our, uh, yeah, the, 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 the image, the, the, the image should be different for a lot of reasons, but you know, we didn't want the image to get too giant sized. <laughs> I think it's good enough. It gets the point across. And you can kind of see how uh, as, the, as the worms kind of go through. It's so like earlier we were talking about this uh, clay subsoil, um, which is, you know, just clay. Then the, the worms will dig through that. And they will introduce organic matter in there and start to create uh, uh, subsoil. And, then, and you'll find, actually, as the worms do that, and more and more of this happens, the soil level will actually rise. It'll go up. And part of that is, is that the worms are going to come up to the surface and, and drop castings on the surface. And you might think, yeah, but that's so little, it's not very much. And it's like, it could add an inch and a half a year while adding all kinds of air channels and organic matter below each year. So oh, yeah. your your soil level will grow and in time those tree roots will be underground again three feet is not a randomly selected depth to survive a winter in montana earthworms hibernate about three feet deep and i see the metric conversion is about 90 centimeters but i i think i would rather that said a meter <laughs> But okay, we're not going to change it. Too late now. now. It's too late. Make a note for the second edition. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a podcast here. So am I. Maybe somebody who's online will go and make a note somewhere. All right. But in hard hard dirt, it is challenging for them to get that deep. Worm towns come with an earthworm freeway between the surface and three feet deep. Easy peasy. In time, the packed dirt between each worm town will become indistinguishable from the worm towns. It's as if the worm towns that you created all grew to form one massive, magnificent worm world, all in your yard. Stuff to put in the hole with your soil. Kitchen scraps, unwanted plants, or rotting matter. Sticks, you know, and like for hookah culture. A half gallon of garden soil, keep it in a gob, do not mix with the other stuff. Lawn clippings, a little bit of sawdust, optional. A few leaves, optional. Only do it once, ever. In other words, this isn't a thing that you have to do every year or every 10 years. Once is enough. 
after this, just keep putting organic matter on top of the soil and the earthworms will take care of everything from there. That's it. That's the whole chapter. And that, that. that last piece actually came from somebody uh, on Permies, right? Who had tried this a decade ago. And they said, yeah, I haven't fertilized my lawn since. He, he tried it. So when I first put it up and I wrote it, and this was at a time when my article was like, I don't know, number one when you searched for lawn care. And I was getting so many people asking me questions about lawn care. And so I wrote this and I suggested it and he tried it right away. And a month later, his lawn went from horribly pathetic and miserable to just absolutely magnificent. And he posted pictures of it all. And so the pictures are up on permies and i uh and i've heard from a lot of other people that have tried it but this guy posted pictures and so i wrote to the guy and i said you know how's it going and he's like it's better than ever still absolutely magnificent and he he talked he wrote on that thread some more i believe yeah. but i've he i've heard from a bunch of other people that tried it and had great success um you know, but they didn't supply pictures and stuff. And it was just, you know, sometimes it's just in person and in mention and how great it is. But it's the, the big thing is, is usually what, like if you talk to a lawn company, then what they would want to do is to bring in sod, you know, yeah. uh, or water more often and fertilize more and things like that. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's, that's not. Fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does work. What they're suggesting will work to some degree. There are techniques you can use, but it's like they're very intensive, and a lot of a lot of times, when from the work, they they have to bring in um, the herbicides, the broadleaf herbicides, mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, "Oh, this is to give the grass a chance and stuff." So, um, I think that what we're suggesting here is something that can be done entirely without herbicides, and it's mostly patience. Yeah, um, and uh, plus. I don't know. I think I think that this technique really kind of um, glues somebody in to uh, like like what some of the permaculture approaches are. Now, one thing that I remember doing when I was a teenager is um, putting in post holes at this location, and we had a gasoline powered post hole digger. Um, which was, of course, stinky and smelly and nasty. My back still hurts from the last time. No, I'm just kidding. Those yeah. things are hard. Yeah. Well, the, the one that I did was a two-person thing. Yeah. And I was amazed at how great it worked. I mean, we were making three-foot-deep holes in like a minute apiece. And um, after an hour, we just had, I don't know, we had more than 50 holes. Oh, that, that was like, not my experience. Oh, okay. Maybe it's different soil or something yeah, like that. Yeah, pretty but, much 100% clay where I was Oh, where I was okay. All right. And so, we were digging deeper. But anyways, go ahead. And digging deeper, that would do it. And of course, back then, I was a teenager. <laughs> And so I, I could, uh, I, I think I had a little bit more stamina back then. Um, anyway, uh, uh, it, it is something that can go pretty quick. And then for a backyard, you might only do a dozen. Like a dozen might be all you need to do. Um, and and uh, you could do that with just a shovel. Although, of course, if you hit that clay, it's possible that uh, you might want to add a little water to help you deal with that clay as you're digging down. Um, but, I mean, if you've got a massive earthworm population, they're going to, you know, help repair everything for you. So, right. All right. I, I see tons and tons of comments. Now, one of the things we said we're going to get back to later was the idea of somebody had that clay that was just like a couple of inches down. And so um, I think that the worm town thing is the best approach for that. I agree, 100%. Now, one problem with doing it in clay is that when it rains, it could kill all the earthworms that because is, yeah. it fills up with water. And then, of course, then it goes anaerobic, and it can be such a, a mess. And so then I kind of think, like, okay, that is that, that makes it so it's not a quick solution. 
But then the quick solution is going to be something like maybe do the Wormtown thing, but instead of doing it with holes, rent a ditch witch or rent an excavator. Well, an excavator is going to compact all your soil horribly. But the idea would be that if you did this in such a way that you, any excess of water that built up in this trench that you're making could drain somewhere. Yeah. Then your worms are going to be okay. I mean, really that's what you got to do is you're thinking of like, how do I make it so that, how do I make a worm town and I've got clay? Now, if you've got sand or gravel or anything else, your worms will be fine. Mm -hmm. But with clay, it's going to be like, okay, I have to have a way so they won't drown. So I need to do something so that this water can drain. Now, if you're out in the middle of a big flat area and you can't drain it anywhere, mm -hmm. I don't have a solution other than like installing some kind of sump pump or like if water, like you're going to make something that's, that's like maybe four feet deep and the trench is going to be connected to that. And then it's a spot that's open and then there's a pump at the bottom. And then if excess water gets in there, it'll pump it out. But that just seems like such crazy overkill. Surely there's another way. I just don't know what the other way is. Um, I mean, it's going to depend on each site. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's super site specific. Yeah. If you yeah. have a high water table versus a low water table, or if you have some organic matter in your topsoil, then that would help there's going to be a lot of yeah lot so of factors. we do have several clay pits up on the lab but most of the soil is like like uh rocky or gravelly up there right. um and so all if we just if we just put in the worm towns it'll be solved and uh and of course now we've got a different problem here at base camp in that we're on top of solid rock Although um, we did just recently make the decision to be like, okay, here where the septic tank is, we're going to just have this be a lawn um, because we need to be able to get at the septic tank from time to time. Yeah. And so we don't want to build a hugel culture on top of it. Um, and it's just this flat spot. Be, we can make a little lawn and, and then have like a little picnic table there or something. Right. So um, uh, the grass... What was growing there was mostly weeds and rather pathetic. And so um, I've been going back there and trying to fertilize it a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, we laid down a little bit of sand uh, that we, we brought up from another part of the property that has a lot of sand, uh, Arrakis. And then um, uh, recently, uh, one of the boots that's here, Jennifer, she planted a bunch of uh, Dutch white clover there. And we've got little tiny babies coming up right now. And so hopefully that clover will convert a lot of this into a more of a soil. Because what's here right now is pretty pathetic. And so um, let's let's get that converted to something nice. Right. All right. I see tons of comments flying by. What have we what do we got here? What is are there any questions? Is there are we done with this podcast? I think we're just about done. Yeah, the conversation's been been good. People are chatting with each other about clay and such okay. things. But I see something I have to comment on. A French drain system is a possibility. I want to say that French drain stuff is the perfect solution for 8% of the places where French drain has been installed. So most people, they put in French drains... And they're thinking that the water will come from above, hit the French drain, and then the French drain will take it away. And um, But French drain is actually not designed for that at all. And it really doesn't help with that at all. But what French drain is good at is if the water table from below is coming up. And then it's designed to make sure it gets no higher than the French drain. Now, if you've got a place where the water table has gotten to be four inches deep above the surface, then yeah, a French drain can help with that. 
But it, for a lot of stuff, it's like, okay, we don't want the soil here to get saturated. It's like, yeah, the soil here is still going to get saturated um, because the French drain does not help with that. It, right. uh, you know, if it's just saturating, then it's like the French drain is doing nothing. It's, it's, it doesn't, it cannot stop saturation. It can only stop saturation to the point that it's become full on water table level water. Right. Yeah. And so, um, I, I usually think wherever somebody's thinking about putting in a French drain, I usually put in, um, like a shallow ditch or I, I will change the ground shape slightly so water will go in the direction I want it to go in. Yeah. That is like, that's a 100% solution. And, yeah. um, uh, it's okay. far more reliable. It never plugs. Yeah. Um, things well, and nature. like, I don't know how much of this you get where you are, but like here it gets freaking cold for long stretches at a time. And so it's like things freeze. Yeah. And then they don't thaw out. You know, you're sitting there and like all the snow is gone, but your culverts under like people who have culverts under their driveways or whatever, they're still frozen solid. Right. And, and backing up ditches for miles. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so now you've got this big, you know, lake problem and it's like, why is there a lake there? I've got a French drain <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it can't get through that ice. You know, that's just below the surface. But if you just shaped your ground a little bit, you know, did your earthworks a little bit. Yeah. So, um, uh, but the big thing is, too, is like just putting in a French drain uh, doesn't exactly help. And the, I mean, one thing that some people could do in a clay scenario, but it really doesn't fix it, would be like, okay, let's put it. You want to have worm towns three feet deep. All right, let's dig a trench that's six feet deep. And we'll fill in the lower three feet with like, river rock and and it's kind of like and then on top of that we're going to put in the soil that's going to be basically the worm town and it's like that that works i think that's still not going to work enough because because then what's going to happen is is that your worms will still all drown and die because you're sitting in the middle of basically uh a tub of clay and the water still can't permeate the clay and get away. And, um, and then you also don't have any evaporation happening cause it's all kind of underground. Um, I mean, I suppose you could do something where you've got something that looks like a wishing well, maybe only it's a big air vent <laughs> to go down to that. Then at least that excess water could eventually evaporate, but it will only evaporate during the warmer months. And yeah. it's during the colder months that you're getting all of this excess water. And then so it'll still be just enough water so that all of your little wormies will drown. So it's kind of like, uh, still doesn't quite work. Um, you've got to be able to drain it somewhere. I think that the best you could do is that thing with the pump. I think there's got to be a better way, but people got to just go out there and play with it and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, a, a, another way would be to um, add, uh, like, like you could, well, I was going to say add 18 inches of topsoil, you know, uh, and then it's like at least it's 18 inches deep sitting on top of the, um, the clay. And then it just has to, you know, any water that gets in there in excess is going to just bleed out to the neighbors, I guess. Right. You know, um, that's a that's a possibility. I mean, this is what we're talking about. This is in the chapter about lawn care, and we're shooting for lawn care. When it comes to gardening, of course, we're going to use hugel culture beds, which yeah. will do great on top of clay. They'll do magnificent. Um, but all right. Let's see. Oh, there's something about a solar pump. Um, oh, pu you know, pumps aren't a bad way. They are very useful. Uh, and don't put it on neighbors. <laughs> I think that's probably a good policy. Yeah, good policy. All right. I think I'm ready to wrap this thing up. Anything yeah. else you could think of that we should add here? Nothing? Uh, no, let's call it. 
If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com, where would you believe it? We actually have a forum dedicated to lawn care, homesteading, and permaculture all the time.